Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Brother David for leading us in song. You know, this is kind of the way the old-timey preachers worked. Uh, they traveled and they took their song leader with them. And so we've had, we brought David up here the last three or four years and uh, appreciate you giving him the opportunity to lead. Uh, David is one of my best friends and we spent a lot of time together doing the will of God. But God bless you for being here today. Glory and honor, power and strength to the Lord. Glory to God. That's really what our service is about, isn't it? And we're going to be studying from the Word of God. I have all my verses lined up. I've got my slides laid out. And we hope that in the course of the hour this morning that you will conclude that we've given glory to God, that all of us together, not just Max, not just David, but all of us together giving glory to God, because that's who and what we are. We are people who give glory to God because He is our God. We are His people. And we'll do that now in this part of our lesson by learning some truths from His Word. And I want to tell you how that I count it as an honor. Every time I stand up to preach, I count it as an honor to be able to proclaim the glad tidings of God. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. And if you're a guest here this morning, we consider you as an honored guest, and we hope you'll stick around for a few minutes so we'll have a, a minute or so to chat after services today. Well, one of the marks of identity of the New Testament church is that it nearly always faced trouble. You go through the book of Acts, you see one problem after another. Sometimes the problem is within the church. Sometimes it's coming from the outside that the devil is attacking the people of God. But Acts chapter 5, that's where we're going to focus this morning. Acts chapter 5 is, a, is an interesting slice of early church life. You see, trouble is seen within the church in the first part of that chapter. It's seen with Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, what was happening at this time, there were a number of destitute Christians in the church at Jerusalem. And brethren were giving of their means. They were laying and taking their goods, selling them, or laying the money at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made to those who were in need. Well, Ananias and Sapphira wanted to get in on that too. They sold a piece of land. They took part of the money and gave it to the apostles for distribution, but they kept back part of it. And there was nothing wrong with keeping back part of the money, but they lied about it. They, they in essence, said, Here's how much we sold the land for, and we're giving it all for the cause of God. Well, that was a lie. They lied, and they died. You talk about, if you were here for our last lesson, choices and consequences. Bad choice followed by bad consequences. But as you get a little further in the chapter, starting at about verse 17, you see a little bit more about early church life where here's a problem coming from outside and here the apostles are arrested, the Jewish leaders arrested the apostles and ordered them to stop preaching. Well, they released them, but they first gave them a beating. And so you've got trouble inside the church with Ananias and Sapphira, but you got trouble coming from the outside from those who are persecuting the people of God. But couched right between these two trouble spots is a little section of Scripture that is really easy to overlook. It's a small section that tells us several significant things about life in the early church. We're looking at verses 12 through 16 of Acts chapter 5. And I appreciate the brother who read it this morning. We're going to read it one more time just to make sure that we're familiar with this text. And I'm reading now from the New International Version. Here it says in Acts chapter 5 verse 12 that the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. By the way, this is a representation of Solomon's colonnade where large numbers of people could gather. But it goes on to say in verse 13 that no one else dared join them even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord 
and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. That's what I mean by a slice of early church life. And, and I, I believe that there are five lessons, at least five lessons that we can gain, that we can glean from this short reading of Scripture. First, the first lesson I want us to see is this, that the gospel, the gospel message continued to advance. Now, I, I think that's important because what happened to Ananias and Sapphira? There, these two Christians were struck dead on the spot for their lie that they told. And, and you might think, well, that's going to hurt the progress of the gospel because some of these Christians have now been put to death and, and, and not... Not many people are going to want to believe the gospel, but we'd be wrong if we thought that was the case. This action on God's part actually produced blessing and growth. You see, Satan works within the church to try to divide. He works within the church to disrupt, to disgrace, and to destroy. But Satan will always fail if God's people are faithful to him. You see, we recognize, and it's something that even the people of the world, most of them recognize, we recognize that the local church must have standards and that lying is unacceptable. And when the lie of Ananias and Sapphira is exposed, well, God intervened. God acted. He upheld his own standard by judging Ananias and Sapphira. But this purging did not in any way hinder the gospel. You see, as you look at the text, it tells us in verse number 14 that more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to the church. This is right after the incident with Ananias and Sapphira. So rather than God purging the church of Ananias and Sapphira, hurting the church, it didn't. It actually promoted the gospel. And even this, in the arrest of and beating of the apostles, that didn't hinder the gospel either. You see, again, if God's people are faithful when there's trouble in the church or trouble outside, if God's people are faithful, the gospel can continue to progress. Look at Acts chapter 5 and verse 41 and 42. This is right after the apostles have been told to stop preaching it tells us in verse 41 that the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they'd been counted worthy. Rejoicing? They just received a beating and now they're happy? Rejoicing? That's right. Rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the Lord's name. Day after day in the temple courts, here where the Sanhedrin and all these are, day by day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped preaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Here's something I want you to take home from this first point. And all five points today will have a take home. Here's our first take home. The gospel that you believe in can progress even in times of opposition. Why? Because it is from God. You need to hold on to this gospel and not let go of it. Hold on to the gospel. Don't give up no matter what. We talked this morning, I believe, in one of our earlier lessons about like running a marathon, running a race. At, at what point do you give up? At what point do you drop out? You do not drop out when it comes to the gospel. We continue to press on no matter what is happening within the church, no, what, no matter what's happening outside. So that's our first lesson. The gospel continued to advance in spite of these problems that the church had. But here's a second lesson. The miracles of the apostles bore witness to the truth. And looking again at Acts chapter 5 and verse 12, the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. Dropping down to verse number 15, the people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats 
so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented with impure spirits. And all of them were healed. These miracles of the apostles, they bore witness to the truth of the message of the apostles. And ladies and gentlemen, when you see miracles in the Bible, rest assured that you're seeing something different than what you see claimed on TV today. There are lots of people today who claim they have miraculous power. But these miracles, these were the real thing. These miracles were performed openly, publicly, and they were apparent to everyone, to friend and enemy alike. That's not what you see claimed on TV today. The Lord gave to these apostles these supernatural powers for what reason? To confirm the gospel message. I'm slipping over to the book of Mark. In Mark chapter 16, right at the very end of the book of Mark, it's Mark 16 and verse number 20. The Lord had promised these apostles that as they went out preaching, he would give them miracles, signs, and wonders. Why were they given? Most people have no idea why the miracles, signs, and wonders were given. Well, people were being healed, and so I guess the miracles, the purpose of miracles was to heal people so people wouldn't be sick anymore. But people still got sick. People still got sick and died. No, that wasn't the purpose. Look at Mark 16 and verse 20, the last verse of the book of Mark. They went out. And they preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. This gospel message that these men preached was confirmed by these miracle signs and wonders. What this means is God verified, God put his stamp of approval on the message. These men went out with the message that Jesus died for our sins. Jesus is raised from the dead. He's at the right hand of God. Well, how do we know that? Watch these miracles. Watch these signs. See these wonders that we perform. This confirms the message. That was the purpose of the miracles, ladies and gentlemen. And by the way, it is worth noting from our text that these men were not about failures when it came to working signs and wonders. If you look at verse 16, these crowds that gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Another translation says, they were healed every one. When you watch what's going on on TV, you don't see real healings. And you'll see people, listen, if you're blind when you go in, you're going to be blind when you leave. If you're crippled when you go in, handicapped, can't walk, you're not going to walk when you go out. I remember being at an incident in Beaumont, Texas a number of years ago where a faith healer came to town and a lady got up out of a wheelchair and walked across the stage. And the man said, she's healed. We've healed her. God has given me a healing ministry. I can speak the word. I can touch the body and the person be healed completely and perfectly. And the woman got up and walked. But we hung around till afterward. And we saw that woman as she was being pushed in her wheelchair by her daughter out to the car. And the woman was crying. She had a very bad hip and she had a back problem. And she couldn't walk. Oh, she could walk a little before she came there. And that's what she did when she got up on the stage. But now she was hurting worse than ever. And she... And, and, and I, Another brother and I are talking to her as we're going toward the parking lot. She said, and she's crying. She says, I just want the pain to go away. But she put her money in the, in the bucket when the guy took up the collection. Frauds. This man was a knowing fraud. And I could tell you a whole lot more about that circumstance than just that little bit. But these people were healed, every one. Now, I've seen people come along and say, well, I don't think they were all healed. Uh, I, do, I don't think everyone who came there to that, I don't think all those people were healed. Let me read that again. Maybe I read it wrong. Crowds gathered from all the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. That's what the Bible says. There are people... 
people all over who claim they have healing ministries, that they have the same power that Peter and the apostles had. If they did, they could go to the community hospital or they could go to, to St. Joe Hospital. They could empty the hospital if they had that kind of power. They don't. That's why they don't go to the hospital. That's why they don't do what the apostles did, because they do not have the power that these men had. Someone says, well, what about this business that you read there, Max, of Peter's shadow falling on some of them? That sounds like superstition. Well, let me just say this about Peter's shadow. There was no magical power in Peter's shadow, just like there was no magical power in the fringe of Jesus' garment. You remember in Luke chapter 8 and in verse number 44, that woman who had the issue of blood, she came up behind Jesus and she touched the edge of his cloak and immediately her, her bleeding stopped. There was no power in that garment. There was no power in Peter's shadow. There was power in Jesus, power in the name of Jesus. It was Jesus who was healing, not, not a shadow and not a garment. The Lord gave to these men the power to heal. And at this point in early church life, I think it's important to note that it was only the apostles at this point in early church life, only the apostles had such power. When you look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 43, on the day of Pentecost, after the apostles worked miracles in the early part of the chapter, verse 43 now, the latter part of the chapter, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs which were performed by the apostles. It's only the apostles at this point that's all you read about in the book of Acts. The others do not have such power. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 6, when this lame man comes in and Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And the man walked. He had, Peter had such power. In Acts chapter 5, the, verses, the verse we've just read, the apostles perform many signs and wonders among the people. All the Christians did not have these powers. Someone says, well, what about Acts chapter 6? Because in Acts chapter 6 and verse 8, there were others who had the power. That's exactly right. Acts chapter 6, verse 8, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. You know what had just happened to Stephen in that text? You back up to verse number 6. These seven men who were chosen to serve the needy widows in Jerusalem, these men were presented to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands upon them. It was by the laying on of apostles' hands that these gifts were given to others. And so it's not until Acts 6 verse 8 that anyone else has that power. No indication that anyone else had that power. The laying on of apostles' hands. I want you to take this home with you. On this second point, take this home that the gospel that you believe in was supernaturally conform, confirmed by miracles. It was absolutely confirmed by miracles, signs, and wonders. Why? Because it is from God. The miracles of the apostles bore witness to the truth. Here comes our third point. Believers in Christ met together with regularity. I'm looking now at Acts chapter 5 and verses 12 and 13. Verse 12, of course, said the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. Now that representation in that graphic is a representation, I think, of Solomon's colonnade. But notice the text says the believers used to meet there. That may indicate that when the book of Acts was written by that time that they were meeting in some different place. But nonetheless, verse 12 tells us that they were meeting together in Solomon's colonnade. What I want you to see here is that regular meetings, they were a part of early church life. Solomon's colonnade, your translation might say Solomon's porch, or Solomon's portico, it was a part of the temple 
that had been built originally, of course, by Solomon. But it was a huge place where more than 10,000 people could gather in an open-air setting that was covered partially, covered with a roof, but was covered uh, on at least one side. So it was an open-air setting where large numbers of people could gather together for public meetings. As early as Acts chapter 3 and verse 11, remember we, we saw that man in Acts chapter 3 who had come to be healed. And Acts 3.11 says, while the man held on to Peter and John, here's that lame man who'd been healed, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. So you see that mentioned at least once before our incident in chapter 5. But the thing I want you to see right now is that the believers met together with regularity. They used to meet in Solomon's Colonnade. And brethren, may I say this to you, that there is something special about us meeting together. I know there are some folks who are viewing on the live stream. May God bless you for joining us on the live stream this morning. But I want to tell you that there's something about being together that the live stream cannot accomplish. It is not God's will that anyone just choose to stay home and, well, it's easier to stay home and uh, have a second cup of coffee and catch a little bit of the worship on live stream. That's easy. I can sit there in my PJs in my comfortable chair, have that second cup of coffee, and if the preacher's kind of boring, I can doze. No one will bother me because it's not like being in the assembly and falling asleep. That makes, I think, worship too easy. But there's something else. It's not just that you're making worship too easy. There is something that we gain by being together, by singing together, by partaking of the Lord's Supper together, by praying together, by studying together in one another's presence. The together aspect, I think of, in, in respect to Christianity, I think the together aspect has been lost because of what we've done in COVID. And, and listen, I recognize that there are some people who cannot get out. And before COVID ever came, there were some people who were confined to a bed. We began our live stream, I think, in 2009. And within a few months of when we began ours, we had dozens of people who joined us every Sunday from hospital beds, from nursing homes, people who were shut-ins at their own home. And that was a blessing to them. But those people were never choosing to stay home because it was an easier thing to do. Listen to these passages. I'm looking first at Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2 and verse number 44. And it says, all the believers were together. You see that word together? And when you go through the book of Acts, how many times do you see people coming together? Whether it was for personal Bible study uh, in someone's home or, or Bible study together as they worshiped or whether it was praising God in Acts chapter 4 and verse number 31, it says, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. The place where they were meeting, the brethren were meeting together. That's the critical thing to see. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 27, here at the household of Cornelius, while talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. There's something about the gathering that the live stream cannot accommodate. In Acts chapter 12, Acts chapter 12 and verse number 12 here again, in someone's house, when, they, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house, this is Peter after he's released from prison, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. This together aspect of Christianity, I think, is sometimes lost on us. In Acts chapter 14, verse 27, on arriving there, they gathered the church together. This is at the end of Paul's first missionary journey. They gathered the church together and reported all that God had done to them, done through them, and how he'd opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. But the church gathered together. One more passage, uh, Acts chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were meeting together. And those are only a sampling of text. 
that talk about the together aspect. And we've only gone to the book of Acts. We haven't gone to other books in the New Testament which talk about the importance of gathering together. But here's my point. When we look at this slice of early church life, the believers in Christ, they met together with regularity. Someone says, well, I, I thought the believers always just met in people's homes. There were times when brethren did meet in one another's homes. But I think it's important to recognize that all the churches, at some time or another, the whole group had to come together. And there had to be a place where they could come together. And for the Jerusalem church, at this time, at this point, in the life of the early church, this place called Solomon's Colonnade was a place where they could come together. Uh, I want you to notice in Acts 15 and verse 22, this is when you've got that controversy about circumcision. The brethren have gone to Jerusalem to try to come up with some kind of solution. When the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, they chose Judas, also called Barsabbas, and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. And with them, they sent the following letter. But I want you to notice in verse 22, the first part of it, it says the apostles and elders with the whole church. That's the gathering of the whole group. There's another passage in the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 14 and verse 23. He says, if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues, etc. He's given them a warning about the abuse of spiritual gifts. But my point is, you have references in the New Testament of the whole church coming together. And I don't like it when I hear people and sometimes preachers who say it. All oh, the early church, they never all met together. They just met here and there in people's homes. You can't sustain that by the Bible when it speaks of the whole church coming together. Whether it's at Corinth or whether it's at Jerusalem or any other place. At this time in Jerusalem, there was no other private venue where the whole church could come together. But you've got this open venue that was open to everyone, Solomon's Colonnade, where the whole group could gather together. This location would handle a large, a large crowd. But there's something really unique about this gathering at Solomon's Colonnade. Get this. Who's in charge of this place? Why, it is the very men... The scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, the Jewish leaders, the same Jewish leaders that only a short time earlier had put Jesus to death. Think about that. There, there, you cannot help but to have some interaction or passing one another in the hallway or in this large open area. You have believers who are in close proximity to those who conspired to kill Jesus. Isn't that unusual? Think about that. Well, I got a take home for you. I told you I'd give you a take home on every point. These brethren saw the need to come together and they were fearless in doing so even in the presence of their enemies. That's point number three. Here comes point four. There were some who were reluctant to join with the disciples. You see that in verse number 13. After you see the believers gathering together in Solomon's colonnade, it says in verse 13, no one else dared to join them even though they were highly regarded by the people. And so the people of the city, they highly regard these believers, but there is a reluctance to join them. Now we might wonder who these people are, the rest who would not join themselves to them. It might be the non-believers, just those who don't believe at all. Uh, maybe there's a healthy fear because of what had just happened, Ananias and Sapphira. Someone says, you know, I don't know if I want to be a part of this group of believers because you see what happened, Ananias and Sapphira, those two hypocrites. And if I'm going to be part of this group, I can't be a hypocrite because maybe I would lose my life like they did. Or maybe there's a fear because these apostles, in chapter 4, Peter and John had already been arrested. Then later in chapter 5, all of the apostles were arrested. Maybe there was a fear of persecution. And so maybe we want, don't want to join to these disciples because we might be persecuted also. You see, when you see things like this happening, judgment of God taking the life of Ananias and Sapphira, and you see persecution of the Christians 
That makes people step back and think for a moment, do I really want to be a part of this? You see, these kinds of things tend to separate the curious from the committed, separate the fakers from the followers, separate the make-believers from the true believers. And that's what I think was happening here when it said of the rest, no one dared to join them. Whoever these people are, who are the rest, there was a reluctance to commit to Christ. Some folks realize, and some don't, but some folks realize that being a part of what God is doing might mean hard work on your part. If you're going to be a part of God's movement, it might require a lot of you. It might require even some hardships on your part. It might be heavy responsibility. It might be criticism from people in the community, criticism from your own family. It might mean terrible persecution by government authorities. And so some people, eh, we're taking a step back, don't want, don't want to be a part of it. But when you take that position that you don't want to be a part of what God is doing, you're going to miss out on untold blessings. These people, they miss the very fulfillment that they were created to enjoy. And instead of enjoying what God has for them, they suffer through, they meddle through a mediocre, mundane existence, standing on the spiritual sidelines and saying, not for me, I'm not going to be a part of it because there's too much responsibility, too many po possible problems. I will give you this take home. When it comes to being a church member, be a church member. Don't be an observer on the sidelines. Dive in. Head first. Commit. This is of God. There's a small band of disciples that meet here in this community. Here we are. Dive in head first. Be a part of this. Don't hold back and say, well, I don't want to get too deeply involved because it could involve work on my part. It could involve persecution. People mocking me. People making fun of me. All that's possibly there. But this is of God. And I want to tell you one thing. When this old ball of fire, when this world is on fire, there's only one thing that's going to survive. And that's the church of our Lord. And you want to be a part of that, my friend. On that day, that's the only thing that is eternal. God has a destiny for you. God has a destination for you. And you want to be a part of that, you need to be a part of his body of believers. That's point four. Here comes our last point. While it's true that there was reluctance on the part of some, more and more men and women were still being saved. That's what you read in verse 14. You see, it talked in verse 13 about some who would not dare to join them. Nevertheless, see, here's the contrast. Verse 14, nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. What number is that? Why, it's those who, those who constitute the New Testament church. They were added. And how were they added? They were added in the same way that believers were always added. They were people who heard the gospel and believed it and they obeyed Jesus Christ in faith, repentance, and baptism. That's what they did. Acts chapter 2 verse 47 in the King James Version says, The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Who was being saved? Well, it was the people like you read about in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. They said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied and said, Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promised gift of salvation. The promise is for you, it's for your children, for all those who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. That was happening in Acts 2. It's also happening here in Acts chapter 5, let me read the verse again. More and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Whenever you see a case of conversion in the book of Acts that is detailed, you'll see it's always like this. 
It's about faith, repentance, and baptism. We see this little slice of early church life. But what's at the heart of the lesson in these five or six verses that we've read? Verse 14, that's the heart of it. It says, you too, just like these people, you too can be saved. This salvation is for all, for all who will believe in Jesus. And brothers and sisters, that's your ultimate take home, that salvation is for you. And I want to ask you a final question. Well, two questions, actually. If you had been, if you had been in that city, in that time, that day, under those circumstances, with trouble in the church, trouble outside, would you have been among the believers who were added to the Lord? Well, you can't really say because you weren't there. And you can't go back there. But what about here, in this city, in our circumstances today? Are you going to be counted among the believers? Some have already chosen to be among the believers. They've believed on Jesus, they've confessed Christ, and they've been baptized into Christ. But what about you? I know there are people here this morning who need to obey Jesus Christ in faith, repentance, and baptism. Don't be reluctant like some of these were. You may say, but I don't know enough yet. I haven't studied enough. We've got folks here who will study with you today after we dismiss. Because we want you to know the truth that we know about Jesus so you can be one of his servants. There's room in God's kingdom for people like you. Whoever you are, whatever your background, whatever your history, there's room for people like you. These people were sinners. That's what I am, what you are. But there's room, and God will accept you on his terms. If that's for you today, if you need to respond to the gospel call, why not come now as we stand and sing? Come now, please.